Good morning to each of you. Let me put my mask so I can be heard. Uh, welcome to worship this morning as we hear God's word and celebrate the sacrament of the altar together. Uh, just uh, really just one announcement for me. Steve has one too. But last week I um, announced about the devotional booklet and said that Ash Wednesday is a week from Wednesday. It's a, still a week from Wednesday. Um, I was wrong last week, but right this week. So uh, if you want a devotion booklet, if you're listening and watching via the internet, right, call the church office and we'll get one to you in the mail. That's it. Okay, the only announcement I have is that um, the Bible study on Thursday is going to start at noon rather than 1 o'clock. Um, that, that, uh, that's my announcement. Just a, a one hour change. So, if you're making it one, you should be able to make it to noon. I'd like to see everybody there. Okay. Is it here? I don't know. God, merciful Father, I am a poor, miserable sinner. 
confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter suffering and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to you, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and a servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will sing to the Lord, because he is still found to believe with me. Consider, answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he is dealt bountifully with me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, 
Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these, who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might. The law, though not, no, well, missed that. I'm sorry, I've lost my place. Not before. Oh, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known him? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16c to 27. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then of my own will? What then is my reward? What in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law. The law, not, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. That I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share them with in his blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we and imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one of beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, 
Let us go unto the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is what, why I came out. And he went throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again for the glory of the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. Now I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and in the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs>
first year seminary student, learning the craft of seminary education and not doing a very good job. Quite frankly, he was failing. After some discussion, the dean asked the young man why he thought God was calling him to be a pastor. And he said to him, well, I was a farmer when God called me to be a pastor. I was out plowing my bean field when I saw a cloud in the sky that showed the letters PC. And I took it to mean that God was calling me to preach Christ. Well, the dean of students sighed deeply and said, I don't know about that. Is it possible PC meant plant corn? Mm -hmm. Preaching the gospel as St. Paul did is not for everyone. It does take a, a special gift. Gifts, perhaps. It's a, a difficult task, one that is fraught with a great deal of danger, temptation, and, and perhaps sometimes terror. But not just pastors are called to proclaim the gospel. While we may not be able to preach like Peter or speak like Paul, we have all been called to share the story of Jesus and his love for all of us. In the gospel lesson for today, the word for preaching is kerygma, which means to announce or to herald, to, to speak out in public about what God has done for us. In the text, the word is to tell the good news or to evangelize, to speak one-on-one -on -one with others, to, to have a conversation about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Both are ways by which the gospel is proclaimed or preached, whether it be to a large assembly or to a small intimate group people, perhaps even just one other individual. As you can see, there are many ways of sharing the good news of Jesus. One way is, as I said, to become a pastor, or deaconess, or another church worker. And that takes preparation. A pastor is required to have a bachelor's degree. Deaconess, the same thing. To become a pastor, you need four years of education, earning a master's degree. And if one desires after the master's degree to pursue a doctorate, there's a doctor of ministry and the PhD that can be earned. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes a great deal of financial resources. Even Paul had formal training to become the pastor that he was. He was a Pharisee. He was trained as a young man in the diligent study of God's Word, particularly the Law of Moses by the most famous preacher, rabbi of that time, a man by the name of Gamaliel. But more than that, he spent three years of training in the wilderness, and his instructor was no less than Jesus himself. St. Paul said, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached was not of human origin. I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it by men. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And that was important because to be an apostle required that you be a follower of Jesus and be taught directly by him. And so his three years in the wilderness was his three years of seminary training. Well, we take four years, but he was smarter than we are. He did his work. He prepared. But that's professional church workers, men and women specifically trained with a vocation of reaching out with the gospel message to a world that is filled with hurt and hopelessness. So far, that's not really helpful for you. It sounds good. It sounds challenging. But what does that have to do with you as a lay person? Well, the answer is 
while pastors, deaconesses, and Lutheran day school teachers and others have a vocation, they are not the only ones that are called to proclaim Christ as Lord. You too are called to proclaim Christ and Him crucified. Martin Luther spoke of Christian vocations as the ministry of the laity. One man, Gene Bythe, wrote, for Martin Luther, vocation is nothing less than the focus of the Christian life. God works in and through vocation, but he does so by calling human beings to work in their vocations. In Jesus Christ, who bore our sins and gives us new life in his resurrection, God saves us for eternal life. But in the meantime, he places us in our temporal life where we grow in faith and holiness. In our various callings as spouse, parent, church member, citizen, and worker, we are to live out our faith. And the reason for living out our faith is so that we might be able to proclaim, to announce, to share the goodness of Jesus. So what is your vocation? What has God called you to do? Perhaps you're a husband or a wife, son, daughter, employee, employer, citizen of the United States. Whatever it is, you have the privilege of using your vocation as a means by which you proclaim the good news of salvation in Christ alone. Your vocation is the result of Jesus' work accomplished on the cross for your salvation. Through the Holy Spirit, God calls you to be as you are, to find your life in Christ, and in, with your life in Christ, to live it out as a servant of the gospel. In that role, you are called to serve your neighbor in the same way Jesus continues to serve you. We find your, our vocation in Paul's word to the Romans. There he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Presenting your body to the Lord means to allow God to use your life in a way that serves Him by serving your neighbor, the people closest to you, as well as people that are distant, far removed from you. In spite of God's call to us to be gospel bearers, we rebel against that. I don't know how to share Jesus. I'm too old or I'm too young. I don't have the gift of evangelism. I'm too frightened that somebody will reject me because of my faith in Jesus. I don't have enough education. I don't know what to say. Or the favorite excuse of mine, that's the pastor's job, that's what we pay him. Whatever the excuse might be, it's an excuse that is without merit. For God calls you and me to service in his kingdom. It is a noble call. It is fraught with danger and joy and sorrow. The prophet Jonah knew that very well. You know the story. He was called by God to go to Nineveh to share the gospel. God called him to preach repentance and salvation. But, Paul, but Jer, jo, Jonah had a serious problem with the invitation. Nineveh was a wicked city. It was filled with violence. Worse yet, Nineveh was the arch enemy of the people of God. And so rather than journeying to the east to Nineveh, Jonah took the quickest ship to go to the west. Well, of course, you know the story. As he was traveling across the Mediterranean Sea, the storm came up. Everything was thrown overboard to create a better ballast. And finally, nothing was working except for one thing. God had something against one of the crew members or passengers on the ship, and that was Jonah himself. So he was thrown overboard, 
swallowed up by the whale. Three days later, spit on land. And God said to him, Jonah, are you ready now? Go to Nineveh and proclaim the good news to those people. Convinced of his calling, Jonah went. And lo and behold, this evil, rabble-browsing bunch of people listened, and they believed that it was necessary for them to repent to save their city. God used Jonah to reach a stubborn, evil, wicked city. And he does the same for you and for me. I don't know what the wicked city might be, perhaps Jackson or Leslie or wherever you find yourselves living. But it's a call that God gives to you just as he gives a call to me. Different functions to be sure, but the same message to be proclaimed. And that is Jesus Christ lived among us, died among us, rose among us, ascended into heaven, and gives us the promise that by his dying and rising, we have the assurance of everlasting life. And that is the message proclaimed. Jesus brings dead people back to life again. Someone once said, we preach as dying men and women to dying men and women. That's the reason for sharing Jesus. Lives are at stake. Eternity in heaven or in hell are the destinations that ultimately we are headed toward. Jesus is the one who delivers us from hell and brings us eternal life in heaven. That's why Paul wrote, Woe to me if I do not share the gospel. Woe to me if I do not share Christ. Because people, people's lives are at stake. A friend likes to say, our task as Christians is to empty hell and fill heaven. Jesus himself is the heaven filler. We are simply his servants, his agents of salvation. Your vocation, whatever position in life you have, is a vocation to share the goodness of Jesus Christ. For only the gospel can deliver people from the threat of hell and bring them the assurance of heaven forever in God's presence. May that be so for Jesus' sake. Amen. In the peace of God which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in that faith to life everlasting. Amen.
God would not disregard us for our sins, but renew us, that our life might be peaceful and our country governed according to his will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For those in need, that in our prayers they would be brought to the great physician of body and soul, whose hand turns away the demon of disease and every effect of sin. We pray especially for David and Neil, Carol and Roberta, Michelle and Martin, Cindy and Courtney, Dwayne and Steve, Kay and Jerry, Colleen, and all those who suffer from the coronavirus, for those who are anxious because of the kind of world in which we live. Grant us healing, Lord, according to your will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those who commune, that we would come to the Holy Supper, believing that where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation, and that the blood of Christ, which atoned for our sins, would make us whole, strengthen us against every spiritual attack of the devil, turn us in love toward our neighbor, and preserve us in body and soul to life everlasting. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless be the Lord. We look. Thanks be to Christ. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And now we praise you that you sent us your only begotten Son, and that in him he is found in fashion as a man who manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord God, from